Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon or this morning, depending upon where you're at. It's been a while since we've had a membership meeting like this, and we're really happy to be here today and that we finally have some time to meet with all of you. I first want to start by thanking all of you for being so engaged and informed during these negotiations, showing up at the pickets, showing up at State of the Airline, um, showing up at two Worldwide Day of Actions. And we are your red pins and your red lanyards um, every time you come to work. Your solidarity is really making the difference in these negotiations. And I want you to realize that it is so important. And I can tell you, your negotiating team really feels that every day that we're at the table. Your support is so important to us. We're going to start this town hall with a negotiations recap of what's been going on the last couple of months. We've had three weeks in the beginning of May in Dallas um, that we met with the company. And our talks continued uh, to Washington, D.C. after those three weeks, and they intensified. We went to D.C. and we met with the National Mediation Board. And um, during that time frame, we also had the Secretary of Labor, Julie Sue, the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, involved in our negotiations. This is not normal. They are very involved in our negotiations and trying to help, help both sides come to an agreement. We really appreciate all their support and their continued support in helping the flight attendants at American Airlines to get an agreement. As you all probably know by now, we were called in on Friday, June 28th, and we were actually ordered by the National Mediation Board to come to DC and to meet on the next day, Saturday, uh, June 29th. Uh, we went to DC, we had two intense days of negotiations, and unfortunately we were unable to come to an agreement. But I will tell you, progress has been made. And um, through the past two months, we have made a lot of progress in the way of um, if, if you look back to where we were in the beginning of May, we were billions of dollars apart. Now, hopefully most of you have read the hotline. We put a lot of this information all the, already out to you. Um, but at the beginning of May, when we were billions of dollars apart, there's been a lot that's happened since then. We've narrowed the gap and the company has added in over a billion dollars to the contract. If you think back to where we started in the beginning of May, the company was holding firm to matching Delta wages and boarding pay. They did not have per diem added into this contract. They also did not have retro pay added into this contract. They were also looking at 2% in the out years. They were also asking us for scheduling concessions. Um, that has changed. We have moved from there. We are not there yet. We will continue to negotiate but there has been movement off of those positions. One of the biggest questions I get from flight attendants is about retro pay. And are we going to see retro pay? Is it going to be a signing bonus? I can tell you, we will not put out an agreement for you to vote on without retro pay, not a signing bonus. We have made it clear, you have made it clear to the company, to management, that you will not accept anything less than retro pay, and that will be in this agreement. I also want to take a couple of minutes to talk about boarding pay. Um, boarding pay is a premium. It will be included in this agreement. We are working on examples for you to, so that you can see the value of boarding pay, but it's really hard to do that without final wages. Um, we're working through that right now and we're going to try and get some information out to you so that you can see what the value of this premium is. If you think about it, we have been hearing about not getting paid from signing or for boarding for a very long time. Our flight attendants have been complaining about this. Flight attendants across the industry have been complaining about this. This is the time to get it into our contract. If we don't get it in now, then we may never see it again for a very long time. So it's time to do it. We'll work on those examples so we can help you understand how much value it is um, to your paycheck, and we'll get those out to you as soon as we possibly can. 
This is one of the items that once you add it into a contract, you can always improve it from there. So you want to understand that if it takes, a, it's hard to get it into a contract, but once you have it in, it's yours and you can make improvements on it from there. Because I still hear from flight attendants saying, I think we should get paid from signing. Okay. And I do too. I think all of us do, but it's very expensive. And so right now we're going to get this boarding pay in and it, it will be a premium and then we will continue to work on it in future contracts. I also want to talk a little bit about transparency because I know that um, we've been very transparent. This is the first time in our negotiations that we've been as tr transparent as um, we have. You all know where we started. You all know what we're negotiating for you. I know that many of you are keeping up with the negotiations and um, the movement that has been made or not made in some areas. And I, I know that there's a lot of complaints or a lot of people want to see that same type of transparency at this point in the negotiations. It's we've moved into a different phase. So um, when we did go to the NMB, um, I know you've seen this in our hotlines. We have um, been asked that we change how much we are putting out about where we are at. Also, a lot of the proposals that we have been doing in the last couple of months have been informal proposals. Um, they're called supposals. Um, so they're not the formal proposals that we've been passing across the table. And um, that's also part of the reason why we do not have um, everything that is uh, being negotiated at this point out in our hotlines like we used to. Um, I understand the need for more information and we're trying to get you as much information as we possibly can. Um, but I will say at this point and at this phase of the negotiations, this is pretty much where, where we're at as far as the transparency. I'm really happy though that you know exactly what your negotiating committee has been negotiating for you and where we started. One of the things in negotiations is that both parties have a starting point. As you've seen, the union um, had a long laundry list of asks and the company also had a lot of concessions that they wanted oh, and a, a long list of asks. So negotiations is basically you both have starting points and you work your way um, through those and you are going to get to a point where you both can come to an agreement on what will be in this contract for you. Your negotiators, I can tell you by all of your emails, by talking to you face to face, your contract action team, hearing from them, we know what's important to you. Um, we've heard it, we've heard it from, and it's hard with 27,000 people. Obviously, everybody has a different uh, uh, item that they would really like to see in this contract. But I will tell you, we know that most important to our flight attendants right now is that the wages um, keep up with inflation, get past inflation because of how long it's taken us to get a contract, that we also have retro pay in this uh, agreement. We know that's important to you and that many of you have already stated to us that you will vote no if you do not see retro pay. So please, that conversation doesn't need to be had anymore. Retro pay will definitely be in this contract. Um, we recognize that everyone is ready for this to be done. Um, I believe that not just uh, the union, all of our flight attendants want it to be done. I believe everybody wants it to be done. We're going to talk about all the union support that we've been getting out there from the, our union outreach, um, but we are trying our hardest to get you the best deal, uh, the contract that you have earned and that you definitely deserve, and um, we are trying to get it done as soon as we can for you. We are meeting next week in Phoenix, and uh, those will, con will continue the mediated talks there, and we are hopeful for an agreement. I also just want to remind everyone, make sure that um, we are handing out stickers that say ready to strike. Um, we are also handing out stickers that say no retro pay, no way. Those stickers need to go on to your bag tags. Please do not place them anywhere on the aircraft, meaning on the outside of the aircraft, on the inside of the aircraft. This is destruction of American Airlines property is how it is looked at and you could be terminated for this. So please make sure you do not put those stickers anywhere on the aircraft, inside or outside the aircraft. It's really important for us to make sure that we do not see any terminations while we are in negotiations. Um, of course, your union is always here to fight for your job, but these are things that can be prevented. We also wanna congratulate 
the Amer uh, Alaska Airline flight attendants on getting a TA. They are in the voting process. Um, as you know, Southwest got their TA a while ago and they passed it final, uh, and their second TA that went out to the membership. And um, we are uh, excited for the Alaska flight attendants to have a TA to vote on. So that's about it. Um, I will say, please read the hotline that came out this week. I believe we mm -hmm. sent it out on Tuesday. Um, there's a few more details in that hotline, but we're getting there. We know how important this is for everyone. We know how our flight attendants are suffering without the wage increases that they desperately need. And it is definitely on our minds every single day that we are there uh, at negotiations. And I wanna thank everyone for all your support. I can tell you when I'm flying back and forth, when I'm in the airport, wherever I am, all of you have been so supportive of the process and more important than anything, I can't tell you how proud I am of this membership and what all of you have done throughout these negotiations. It is really moving the needle and I hope you can see that. Um, the billion dollars that we've seen added to this contract since May is because of you and because of your solidarity. So thank you so much. Please stay with us and we are gonna get there. So we're gonna move on next. Um, I'm going to have Jay Cheng, who is sitting next to me. Uh, she is going to talk to you about the uh, Strike Call Center. She is one of our reps at the Strike Command Center. Hi, my name is Jay Chen. I'm one of the representative of um, APFA Strike Command Center. Um, we are open daily from 9 to 5. Um, for Central Time, we can be reached at 806-478-7453. You can also email us at strike at APFA.org. Um, recently, we've been getting a lot of questions of, am I allowed to strike on probation? And the answer is yes, you are allowed to strike. You are protected under the Railway Labor Act. It is your right to strike. Please don't forget that. And the other thing is, um, for those of you who have not received a strike booklet, please call us and let us know, and we'll be happy to help you um, getting your strike booklet mailed to your place. Um, the most interesting question we've been getting is the proffer of arbitration, and I'm not sure if Julie would like to step in and sure. talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, because um, I think it's really important for everyone to realize where we're at in the process right now. So uh, we are still, we still have our, um, we put in for a release uh, back in January. We never got a response from the NMB yet. Uh, that, prof that release that we have requested is still sitting there at the NMB. Now, as we are negotiating, if we get to a point where we are at an impasse, meaning there is no movement, um, the, neither party is moving, then at that point, the first step for the NMB is to offer a proffer of arbitration. I think probably the biggest question that Jade and the call center is getting is, will the union accept a proffer of arbitration? Um, I think the we, you can all rest easy. We will not accept an offer of um, arbitration, a proffer of arbitration. Okay, it is um, we are the ones who want to negotiate our contract. No one else for us. Um, if either party rejects a proffer of arbitration, then we automatically go in to a 30-day release, okay? During that 30-day release or after that 30-day release, a presidential emergency board can be called by the President of the United States. If that is called, then we're pretty sure that if we are released, that that will be called. Then from that point, that board has 30 days uh, to come up with recommendations to both parties, meaning the company and the union. If either party rejects those recommendations, then we go into another 30 day cooling off period. OK, after that. So I, I hope that that answers as far as the proffer of arbitration. The union does not have any plans to accept a proffer of arbitration. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, talk about when you said the strike booklet that uh, we have flight attendants who haven't received it yet. If you haven't received a strike booklet, please go into APFA.org and check out your address there because I know we've gotten quite a few strike booklets back here at APFA with incorrect addresses. And so please, first thing you should do is go in and see if your address is correct. 
that may be the reason you did not get your strike booklet and go ahead and correct it. And then also we'll send you another one out. Yep, and uh, the strike booklet has um, good amount of information, vast amount of information. You can also visit the negotiation page. It explains the process, um, what status we're at, and please sign up for the hotline, um, follow us on social media, and if we have any updates and information, that's where you will get the correct information from. If you do not understand anything, that's what we're here for. And please feel free to call us, email us, we'll be happy to help. Okay, and I think I misspoke. Um, uh, after we do not accept a proffer of arbitration, we would go into a 30 day cooling off period. I think I said 30 day release, um, a 30 day cooling off period. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, Jade, uh, we're going to move on, I think, to Eric, and he's going to talk about our great union outreach and all the support we're getting from all the unions out there yes. and others. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Harris. I'm your national treasurer. I'm excited to be here today. Um, as Julie mentioned earlier, a lot of pressure put on this company came from our solidarity and strength as members, but also a lot of support we've received in solidarity with our, our union siblings across the country. Um, I'll give you some stats on where we are. We have uh, we've made contact with 103 unions, nine media contacts, 31 politicians and three consultants of that total. 54 have publicly endorsed us and they come in every day. Um, it depends on the process within their internal structure on how to get that out, but they've moved pretty quickly, especially over the holiday weekend. Um, it, you go on the website, we'll show you, or I'm sorry, on social media, you probably have seen on our Instagram and on our Facebook page, some graphics that show APFA logo, APFA's logo with the other union or organization's logo showing their support and solidarity. They've also shown on, or posted on their social media platforms these graphics and we've reposted them. If you see any, please tag APFA Unity in those. Make sure that you repost them as well. We will repost them. We want the public support. We want to show this company that we not only are we standing united and in solidarity, but we have those in our industry as well as other uh, union siblings showing it as well. So we'll show you on our APFA website how to Got it. How to uh, show uh, to sorry to get our supporters to get set up. If you go on the APFA website, go under negotiations and the stand with us page. You click on that. You can direct them there. Uh, this page shows pretty much tells our story. First thing that'll pop up is the ability for them to sign up for our hotlines and to get updates regarding negotiations only. I know we communicate a lot, but if they want to get targeted in the negotiation updates, this is great for them. On the page, they'll be able to hear our story, read our story, why we're fighting, what we're fighting for, and what how they can join us in our fight. The images that are there are my union supports the American Airlines flight attendants, or I support American Airlines flight attendants, or passenger support American Airlines flight attendants. So if anyone approaches you and says, what can I do? How can I get involved? Please point them to this page. Perfect, this has been great. We, yes. we um, as a union, attended labor notes uh, a few months ago, and we made all kinds of contacts uh, throughout the labor movement. And really at this point, I think we're seeing, you know, the results of that. Yes. Uh, Definitely, while we were there, uh, we all had on our red t-shirts pretty much. And I think everybody heard our story, knows our story, and now they're all helping to support us. So um, it's been great. And, and we will continue to grow this list as much as we possibly can. And hopefully, mm -hmm. and, and our passengers we know are already supporting us. Yes, and I'll say the biggest takeaway is that we also stand with them. Um, so this has been not just outreach on how they can support us, but also what we can do to support them. We've already seen some of our reps and our flight attendants and members standing on picket lines with other 
uh, workers, and that's what this is all about. So we thank them and we thank you. Thanks, Eric. All right, let's move on to the Vice President's Department. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, moving on to uh, the uh, SBA Department, and uh, we have been very busy the last few months. Um, we had our last uh, caucus session, and if you don't know the caucus session that we have, these are uh, grievances that we were not able to uh, resolve at the base, and they move up to the uh, SBA department, and we meet with the company uh, usually every other month to review these cases and to try to reach settlements on our flight attendants' behalf. And you can see we've had multiple, so the last, um, uh, caucus we had was back in May. We actually have another caucus this afternoon, um, but this update for uh, what you're seeing on the screen here is from May. So we update the uh, website usually pretty much after each of the caucus sessions. So you'll see this up uh, an update with uh, new cases and hopefully new settlements um, in the next week. Um, but you can find this all on uh, the APFA website under the union. And if you click on SBA grievances uh, tab, you can scroll down and you'll see all the um, base uh, nods that are that are at the base that we're working or that the base is working through. And then also uh, for the SBA department, all the grievances we're working through. Um, so uh, our last uh, uh, caucus, we were able to mitigate attendance points, performance points. We resolved some pay claims, jury duty pay, and early boarding claims. Um, since December, uh, you can see we've settled many uh, terminations and as well as um, sub submitted nods to um, SBA. Hey, Larry. Yes. Introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that part. Mary <laughs> Salas, APFA National Vice President. All right. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. Um, just a, uh, a few uh, highlights here. Again, this is all on the APFA website. We have two currently two open presidential grievances on jury duty and jump seat practices. We are uh, in discussions with the companies uh, on this, on both of these, and. Um, Hopefully we'll, we'll um, get a settlement on this or we will move them forward to arbitration. So that's just an update on those two. Um, our outstanding presidential agreements, the arbitration that we had previously, uh, the closing briefs on that from each of the, uh, the company and from the union side are due on August 2nd. And once those briefs are submitted to the arbitrator, um, it, there's really no set time for the arbitrator to make a decision, um, but we can hopefully get a decision late summer or probably sometime in the fall more than likely. I know everyone's anxiously awaiting the results on that, but that's where we stand on that. Um, I just want to highlight a few things. Of, um, we've seen a recent uptick in terminations related to reserve out of position. Um, I, I, this comes and goes from time to time, but we just want to remind everyone when you're um, serving a wrap on reserve that you have to make that contractual two to three hour requirement, right? And um, if you don't, you get a missed trip or an LC, the, the company will investigate um, the occurrence. And almost always, they pull your travel records, especially if you're a commuter, to determine if you had traveled in for the wrap. And if there's any irregularities, um, this could pose a problem. So please, please, please make sure you're able to make uh, uh, that two to three hour requirement while you're on reserve. All right, if that is it, we're gonna move on. Thank you. My name is Andrea Wallace, and I am the APFA DE&I Chair. So our, our first major project for this quarter was APFA Pride. Um, we were slated to participate in three Pride marches. Two of them have passed, DFW and New York. We have one remaining on August 18th, 2024 in Charlotte. You can scan the QR code to register. We'd love to have you out. 
Um, we did design a limited edition T-shirt for each of our participants. So if you would like one of those, definitely register and come out as well. We are also still working, actively working on heritage pins and specialty cause pins. Um, we are hoping to get both the Caribbean American pin and the Latinx pin out prior to September. In addition, we are also designing an active military veteran flight attendant pin. We want to make sure that there is recognition for our flight attendants that have or are currently serving in the military. So if you are interested in participating in the de design of that, you can definitely send us an email as well. OK, Andrea, before we move on, because I will tell you, I wore the blue shirt in a video and I know when I wore that, everybody's like, I want that shirt. <laughs> so <laughs> how do flight attendants get the blue shirt? The blue shirt is available if you participate in one of our pride marches. As I said, the last one that we have is August 18th in Charlotte. Any remaining pride shirts that we have will be posted to the APFA shop website. And are they going to be up for auction? Like we're going to say <laughs> highest bidder? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding about time. highest bidder, believe me. Uh, uh, since we have another raise yet, I'm not, we're not going to do anything. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> just well, we're hoping to design a new one every year um, just to give us a little something special and to thank you guys, everybody, for coming out to our space. Great. Right? And thanks, Andrea, for stepping up and um, being the new chair. Thank you. Hi, hi, I'm Marty McMillan. I am the national uh, scheduling chair. Jeff Peterson is on vacation. Lucky Jeff, um, he's mm -hmm. the contract chair. So um, I will be flying solo today. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, something we've gotten a lot of inquiries on, and that is the last sequence pay protection coding that you see on your HO1. For a long time, we saw the LS code showing uh, how you were removed or if there was some kind of change to your schedule uh, involving your last sequence, four sequences, and uh, that has changed. And what you see now is either a DC or an FI. And I believe the reason that that has changed is because of programming. I don't know this for a fact. I will verify it and we will send out a hotline again reiterating this information, but um, it makes the process for getting you paid automated and therefore a little more accurate and also quicker. So before when it was an LS code, that was a manual process to get you paid. And I've given some examples here um, in this presentation, a little bit showing you the main things that you need to remember about what the pay is for DCs or FIs. Uh, the first thing to think of is with a direct conflict, that's when your trips wind up overlapping because of a delay. So that's when you get the direct conflict. And remember, you're paying for both sequences, the, the total value of both sequences. It's not designed to give you a windfall, unfortunately. I know that's what everybody would like, but that's not the way it works. You get paid the full value of both sequences combined. And you will see that in the examples of how exactly that will show on your HI1. The other thing is uh, an FI code, and that is when you come in for one trip and you have another trip, but you don't have FAR required rest in between the two trips. That is an FI. That one will pay, you'll get the full value of what you flew on the first trip, and then the value of what the schedule value is for the second trip. A little bit different, but basically you're still being made. Okay, that I'm going to tend to pay a little bit more. You just said it, because this is a term that, was, that came over with the practice, right? right? Um, and the term that was used uh, that I heard for many years is made whole. Made so whole. when you have a direct contract, you're made whole. Yep. Yeah. And that's that's what I think you need to keep in mind is you aren't losing anything. You're being made whole. And I've given a couple of samples in this one. It was a three day trip. The original value was uh, 15 hours for the first trip. There was a second trip that uh, was valued at 1530. So the total value was uh, 3030. But when the sequence, first sequence, went into an extra day, it got paid 20 hours, but the flight attendant still was paid 30 hours and 30 minutes. OK, 
Okay, that's the first example. These are all um, also on the website if you want to take a look. So you have a little bit more time to study it and kind of digest it. Uh, this one, the combined value of the trips was 2530 and in actual operations, uh, the first trip became a four day and paid out 2224. And then there would be a line item added to your HI1 that shows paid projection of three hours and six minutes. So you still got paid 2530. And then this last example, was a churn that was paying five hours, and then it went into a two day, and they had a churn the next day paying five. And so the combined value was 10, and they got paid 10. So that was kind of a want lot because they didn't get the extra day off that you get in the other two examples, but um, still made whole. You would have been flying uh, two days anyway. The other thing I wanted to talk about real quickly is uh, the May irregular operations, because that affected virtually everybody. Uh, the topics that we met with the company on June 25th uh, to talk about with them, hotel issues, the transportation issues, which were absolutely ridiculous. Uh, no positive contact for the reschedules. Uh, there were non-contractual reschedules. There were crews that were completely lost. There were missed trips given for no positive contact, which was unbelievable. Uh, the hold and wait times for cruise scheduling and then the fifth hero failures. So when we went to the meeting, we of course had asked everyone to submit uh, an IROPS form and we received 1100, a little over 1100 forms. And so thank you so much to everybody that took the time to submit the form. It means the world to us. These are the forms. I don't know if I'm on camera, but we do have all the forms printed out. Oh. And when we went to the meeting with the company, we had binders where we gave them the binders of every one of your report that you submitted. And it was quite impactful. They were shocked that, that we had collected that much data. Could not believe it. Um, I will have an update from the company on Friday about the trip miss. Uh, that are being removed due to the IROP. So uh, stay tuned for that. We will post some information. Marnie, I'm going to add in a little bit right yeah, now. Go ahead. This is why the importance of work rules. This this is all about our work rules, right? But we're those thousand <laughs> forms that you have over a thousand forms are violations of our work rules. And I, I think flight attendants have to stop and think about in negotiations when we fight so hard to keep the work rules we have. Sometimes they go like, oh, they violate them all the time. Well, when they violate them, then they have to pay, right? Mm -hmm. If we didn't have the work rules, then this would just be the norm. They would be out there doing whatever they wanted anytime we have a meltdown at, or anytime, and there would be no consequences for it. Um, that's why the scheduling concessions that they have been asking for that we have said absolutely positively no to are so important. And, you know, having these forms, it was so uh, it was great to go to the meeting and be able to say we don't have the resources to investigate every one of these, not saying we are not investigating every one of them because we have already. Um, but we put it back to the company. This is your job. This is yeah. your mess to clean up. You you answer to every one of these and figure out where you need to make your improvement. Right. And I think it really did help. And then the other part of this one, and and Josh is going to put it up. I think we actually have Todd. Oh, we have Todd. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we've been working with uh, Todd Smitala and Ephraim to collect our data. And well, binders are great. Paper is great. When you see it in a graph, boy, does it tell a story. So go ahead, Todd. All right. Hello, everyone. Todd Smitala here, Techno Technology Solutions Architect. Um, let's see, Josh, if you can go to on the job, that's how we get to our little data thing. IROPS data. You can click right there. And you do have to be logged in, so you're going to have to log in. <laughs> I got to remember you my do? password. Yeah. <laughs> Try. <laughs> hey, let me. <laughs> Uh, I have it saved on my computer, so give me one second. No worries. Uh, it, and it, this is one of those cases you just have to be anyone logged in. This can be retirees. This can be really anyone who's ha who has an APFA account can log in. 
um, to do this. It's not restricted like it is for you know certain access to the website. The only the reason this is is because of Power BI itself. It has to have a logged in person. So that's the one reason. Yeah, Ideally, I would have liked to have the general public see this because it's kind of humiliating. Mm -hmm. So right. OK, here we go. So this gives us let's just look at it quickly. Um, you know, over, overall, this is mostly from May. We have 1116 uh, reports that have come in and most of them are from May. So if you look in the lower right hand corner, you can see 60 minutes plus transportation wait time. This is a general theme, right? And you can see it's it's glaring. This is really ridiculous, right? Um, the second one, if you look on the crew tracking and crew scheduling wait times, the overwhelming majority, again, is between one to two hours that people are waiting at this time. Now, ideally, during an IROP situation, it should be 15, maybe 30 minutes max, right? So this really does tell you a lot just looking at it at a glance. And you can see the number one issue right away is getting a hotel room. So there is a theme. Now you can drill down into different aspects of this. If you look in the pie chart, the overwhelming majority there is for Dallas, but you can look by base. You can click on each, you know, any of those if you want to on the pie chart itself. You can also do, Joss is showing you, you can look, do the drop down. Um, you can target a particular time, like um, the IROPS issues that we were having in May are pretty much the last week. So if you click on there, it's going to show all of May. If you click on the little carrot going down, you can specifically look at a few dates. So you can choose just maybe you just want to see what happened on the 19th. All right. And then if you need to clear things out that they were all selected. So when you clicked there, he unselected that date. So if you click reset the reset button in the middle in the upper left there, then it brings it all back to where you were at the beginning. And let's say, yeah, try that again. Let's look at just May 31st to see what happened on that day. So, you know, much um, you know, fewer, fewer reports, but still the same theme is going on there. 60 minutes plus people are waiting. One to two hours scheduling times. All that kind of stuff. OK, so that's. That's basically how you navigate through there. If you go down a little bit further, then we have these are what people have to say about it when they filled out their reports. So you can you can sort by base. You can type in the base and say you want to look and see what Miami was doing. And again, you can also sort by the um, the date. Maybe you're just looking for again May 31st. What was happening on May 31st? All right, and then you can just scroll through. You know, there's pages and pages here, and you can read all the drama. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a good way. I mean, you know, it's we can we, we need to track these things. So here you can this see a lot of great. data at, yeah. at a glance. Mm -hmm. Very great. This is, you know, thank you, Todd, for all your work on this. Mm -hmm. I know Afram Yosef, who also works here at Afram, EPFA, yeah. a new position that we added a, a couple of years ago, a new mm -hmm. staff position. He's a our. Uh, Data, data analyst, um, and of course now the IROPS forms. Um, mm -hmm. We need flight attendants to fill them out so that we can help to take care of all this and also to track it. Right. Um, this is what right. we really need. So and we've tried to make that IROPS form super user friendly, so it's really just more click, click, click your into, mm -hmm. and then just a few sentences about what actually happened to help clarify anything that you want to clarify for us. But it really is data is everything. When we walk in with this, yeah, it gets attention. So I had a flight attendant on my flight to Dallas this week um, who had a um, issue during the meltdown. I asked him if he filled out the form. He had not, um, but he wrote it to, he wrote it into his uh, base rep, mm -hmm. uh, sent a, them an email. And he also gave me it on a napkin. So can I turn that napkin somehow into, you know, a form? <laughs> you know? <laughs> to add to it. But that's why I think, you know, I know this will take us a little time to get our flight tents used to it, right. um, to changing kind of how they do things. But all of those forms actually went to the base reps also. So yes. it's not like anything didn't go to the base rep to handle. Right. Um, they all got all the forms that had been filled out by their flight attendants. Right. And also the forms 
automatically generate a spreadsheet, which is also another means for us to be able to go through and track which ones the company has corrected, paid out, or is disputing so we can go in and, and take it from there with a nod or whatever else we need to do. So that all of that's really super helpful. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Marty. Uh -huh. All right. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Reinhardt. I'm the uh, National Safety and Security Chair. So what I want to discuss is our notification system. We started this in January. That's the phone number 817-357-8786. This is a very important tool for us and a resource. It does a multitude of different things. One, it notifies us here at APFA of what's happening to you if you're experiencing a critical incident while on duty. This is truly an emergency line only, but it it's you know it does provide you resources. I'll get into that in a second. That's important that here at APFA we know it's happening if you're experiencing an emergency out on duty because we've had it in the past. Still, sometimes happen. American Airlines does not let us know if you're experiencing an emergency and the status of your well-being. So this allows that gap to get closed if you utilize it. And then we make sure that all parties are in the know about what's going on with you out there. And this will um, initiate internal procedures that we have uh, at APFA Safety along with EAP, National Officers Base President, uh, and their reps there at the base level to ensure that support is being provided to you and that uh, accountability is being upheld by um, the company to provide you that support in these events. And it will provide you information and steps to follow, checklists, things that you need to know and what you need to do next immediately following the event. So on this next slide, I have six prompts with it. You call the number, you'll hear an opening message, but you honestly don't even have to do that. You could press one of the prompts and you can leave us a voicemail. You could text that number, but no matter what, if you select a prompt, you will receive texted to you information with steps to follow, contact information, things that you need to do next following the type of emergency event that you're experiencing. So I will hope everyone will take this number, save it in your phone, take a screenshot of this image here. In the future, I'm hoping to get some um, ID backers with this on there. Uh, I'm hoping to get that worked out here in the next few months. And just so that we use this as a, a tool to help get through those critical incidents and it provides you information. It's a quick way to find out what do I need to do next. So next here I'm talking about it's summertime, right? So what are we dealing with in the summer? Hot cabins, cabin odor fume events, they're on the rise. Turbulence is crazy. So you can use this system to help you after one of those events. I have prompts for hot cabin and for cabin odor fume event, providing you information, letting us know here at APFA what's going on with you. And as well as if you're experiencing extreme turbulence and you're injured, we have a prompt for injury on duty. You'll be connected with pertinent IOD information and contact or you'll soon meet her, Jenea Bigcraft and her team at IOD here at APFA. And what's big with these events and what's really important now that we just spoke about some incredible data is data. We have to report these properly. We have to make sure that we're reporting hot cabin turbulence, cabin odor fume events with SERS reports, as well as cabin ASAP. And then for hot cabin and for cabin odor fume events, I know we usually say SOF, we're trying to move away from that term. Uh, there are forms on the forms page of APFA.org, as well as on the safety and security page. Uh, we also have them in the link that we send you if you utilize our system. And uh, reporting with those forms along with your SERS and cabin ASAP allows us to have data here in house. Uh, I just pulled up the most recent numbers for the hot cabin report form for this year. We're up to 65 as of today that we were nowhere near that in September last year. And every year hot cabin is an issue. We deal with it. The company likes to say that they they've, they've, they've you know they've uh, made things more streamlined at their end things are better and I go well I have uh, I spoke with them the other day I have well, I have over 56 reports that say otherwise please keep sending them in that helps us challenge these procedures that we do not agree with and to hopefully enact change and uh, it'll be the hill that I die on we get that 90 degree progression <laughs> back to something normal I'm so if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to us at safety at APFA.org. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. All right, and if you can okay. yeah. turn this over to Lori. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, Lori Glatley with the ACT-ARC um, along with Ali Malice. Um, 
So many of you probably do not know what ACT ARC stands for. It stands for the Air Carrier Training Aviation Rule Making Committee. This was chartered in 2014 with industry stakeholders and the FAA to actually research and do recommendations for safety issues. So one of the safety issues that we're going to start um, researching and gathering information on is turbulence. And the um, according to the NTSB study in 2021, turbulent related accidents are the most common type of accidents involved in air carriers operating under Part 121. And it's really skyrocketing with the change of um, well climate change. And we are trying to figure out what we can do to help mitigate injuries with turbulence. Uh, next slide, please. So the Turbulence Training Work Group has been established to study and how to mitigate impacts of the turbulence on health and safety of cabin crew. The members include the FAA, pilots, flight attendants, mechanics, passengers, advocate group, dispatchers, training, and stakeholders um, across air carriers and operators. And then we are all working together to gather the research and then we're going to analyze the data and then you can go to the fourth slide and once we once we analyze the data and make a decision on um, on best recommendations we will actually um, recommend we will give the recommendations to the FAA what is the best um, way to handle turbulence and what we should do with our flight attendants should they be seated at 18,000 feet versus 10,000 feet but this is going to be this is going to be a one to two year study so that's it thanks Lori you're welcome all right we're moving on to health and Kathy Hi, Sharp everyone. will be presenting today oh sorry okay. yeah this is Kathy Sharp uh, reporting out for Haley Brewer National Health Chair and um, we wanted to talk to everyone about surgery plus there's been a lot of concerns and calls and emails regarding the card you received in the mail we just wanted to assure you surgery plus is not mandatory it is a voluntary option for all procedures except bariatric surgery so this is not on an issue for this for 2025 um, so everybody can rest at ease great thank you kathy Perfect. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Paul Hartzorn. I'm responsible for communications for APFA and interacting with the media. Um, I think you pretty much know what my department does. I, I hope we're doing it well for you. Um, I did want to just point out some areas on the website uh, where we are posting our uh, media interactions. I will say how many, I don't even know how many system wide tickets we've had, eight, seven, eight, nine. Oh, um, we're, we're beyond that. Are we beyond that? <laughs> and then also the Worldwide Days of Action and then the uh, State of the Airline uh, when we show up there. Uh, and also uh, the, the base specific tickets like the New York City JP Morgan Industrials Conference. Um, we hear some feedback saying, why are we doing so many pickets? This, this isn't really helping us. This isn't doing anything. Um, it is doing something. And what it's doing is keeping our fight at the forefront of the media. And that's what we want. Um, and it is working. I have media checking in from many networks weekly wanting updates now. They're calling me. We're not sending out press releases. They're calling us to get the update. So what you are doing, and this is all because of you, this is because you guys are showing up on the picket lines and you guys are showing up at the state of the airline and you are showing up at conferences where CEO ISIM is speaking and that's resonating with the media and it's keeping our fight at the forefront. So thank you for that. Um, what we've done here, just really quickly on this slide, I just wanted to show that you probably already know, but we've added a carousel right here to the landing page of APFA.org. You can sc scroll through that and see the uh, latest uh, news releases or articles in which were mentioned. Um, you can also, at the top of the landing page, you can click on news and you'll find many, many uh, articles in there. We hope we collect them all. Sometimes we miss them and we go in and add them later, but there are literally hundreds of um, articles on there in which you are mentioned uh, at all bases across the system, at satellite bases, just everywhere. People are reaching out and asking us for updates and asking us to keep them involved. Also on that same news page, if you scroll down, you'll see we've compiled videos 
of our flight attendants, our contract action team, our line flight attendants speaking to the media everywhere from Los Angeles to Boston, um, across the country, uh, telling our story. And that's what we need to do. So if anyone reaches out to you, you'll feel comfortable talking to a member of the media. You, they've contacted you on Instagram or whatever. Please let me know. Happy to help you um, with that. But I just want you to know that the, the, the reason this is happening is because we are out there. We are out there on the picket lines and we are keeping our story at the forefront. So if anyone tells you that picketing is not working, working, I'm here to tell you that it is. And I appreciate all of you uh, for being involved. Thanks, Paul, for bringing that up. I will say, can we go back a slide uh, to the, no, the other one? Hey, nope, back on that one. So I'm looking through this. I don't see any of the bloggers on there. <laughs> oh, do you want to talk about the bloggers at all or we, not? We, we, we have a lot of bloggers reaching out yeah. uh, to, and I try to make sure that they have the best information possible. People feel very differently about uh, other bloggers and how they paint our fight. Um, I, I make sure that whenever I'm contacted or if I'm able to contact them, that they have the best, most factual information available. I will continue to do that. One thing I should also mention is uh, Julie and myself and some of our contract action team members and then some of our base leadership, base representatives have been participating in podcasts. We're going to get that up on the website as well. Uh, a lot of labor po uh, podcasts have been reaching out. As Julie mentioned, when we attended Labor Notes earlier this year, um, we made a lot of connections uh, with some really great labor podcasts. Um, and we'll get those on the website uh, for you as well. So really just everyone's just reaching out. They're reaching out to me. It's it's incredible. It's great uh, looking for updates. Even when we send hotlines, not even press releases, they're getting a hold of those and calling and saying, what does this mean? So it's great. So thank you for being out there on the picket lines with us. And I kind of brought up the bloggers because I think a lot of the bloggers also don't actually get information from us. They just put out what they want to put out. And so some of the bloggers, I would say, are not necessarily friends to unions. Um, I think you probably all know who they are. Um, but it is, you know, it, the bloggers are definitely a kind of, they're very different than the news. If, and I wanted to kind of make that separation yep. here. <laughs> there, are, there are some that we can't crack through and, get, and they don't want the good information. They want clicks, right? Yeah. But there are some that reach out now uh, that I have on, on my list that are actually reaching out to us for some good information. So it's progress with the bloggers. That's all I can say. Um, always reach out to me if you're reading this or watching this, and I'm happy to give you some good information. Thanks, Paul. All right, hello everyone. My name is Adam Mullins. I'm the National Ballot Committee Chair here at APFA. Uh, my committee is responsible for running all the elections and the balloting that take place here at our union, which is one of the most important parts of being a member is getting a voice here on what goes on. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that are currently going on as well as some uh, hot topics and future things. So first up, we are running a special election for the remainder term of the Boston based Vice President. Uh, it's the first time a long time Boston's uh, had an election, so this is exciting. It does close tomorrow, July 12th at 10 a.m. Central Time or 11 a.m. if you're on the East Coast. Um, the ballot count will be here at APFA headquarters. And again, as I mentioned, it's to fill the remaining term, which is effective tomorrow all the way until March 31st, 2025, which was when all the uh, terms for the base officers end. So if you're based in Boston, please make sure you get your vote in. It is being done uh, electronically, online voting, because it's a special election. And uh, if you need balloting credentials or you need to get your credentials, you've misplaced them or you're out flying, you'd like to vote, you can reach out to the Yes Elections Help Desk. We just sent out another election reminder, a final reminder hotline today that has the Yes Elections Help Desk information. It's also available on the Union Elections uh, page on the API. FA.org website, which brings us to an important topic that we get a lot. Uh, you know, why are, why are some elections or balloting um, being done online, like the strike vote or some of these special elections like Boston or LaGuardia last year and future TA versus paper balloting when we do things like the national officer elections or the base officer elections. So just kind of a high overview, the DOL, uh, Department of Labor and their Office of Labor Management Standards, which uh, holds the laws and regulations for holding union representative elections, they have some very vague guidelines when it comes to electronic voting and online voting. They do have some guidelines, they're just vague. A lot of their laws around union officer elections were written back in the 50s and 60s, so they're outdated. 
Uh, we've been, there's actually been some working groups. We've been a part of that with the OLMS office uh, to work with some stakeholders in the industry. So we are seeing just a little bit of progress, but we all know the government moves slow. So we are pushing, we're hoping in the future to work on a project, maybe with government affairs, or we can maybe push this along and we'd like to see that because it is beneficial to get those electronic guidelines uh, more expansive so that when we're under DOL regulated elections, we have more guidelines available to work within. Um, so that uh, that's kind of the overarching view. It's important to note that the Department of Labor only oversees regularly scheduled union officer elections. So that's going to be our national officer elections and our base officer elections. They do not oversee any special balloting or elections so like strike votes, contract votes, these special elections to fill remainder terms. They don't oversee those. They're, um, those guidelines and stuff just don't apply. Although we always operate to those standards, that's important to note. Um, and we hope to bring at least a hybrid method of voting too. That's why we selected the vendor we did uh, to at least try during those regularly scheduled elections to move back to some sort of electronic component. So that will bring flexibility and ease of use of voting to our membership. We've talked about that several times on these uh, membership meetings. Um, we're currently working with the S selections on finalizing. Um, when I say us, I mean APFA. There's other, a couple other stakeholders involved in IT and stuff. Uh, for the TA balloting. So when we do reach that TA, uh, we will util utilize the single sign on method like the strike vote to make it very easy to vote for your TA uh, by logging in. It'll check your eligibility and then pass you over to that secure uh, voting site with yes election. So we're working with them to finalize and get that all done. Uh, we've, uh, from my understanding, there's been improvements even from the strike vote. Um, <clears throat> We're starting some prep work as we always do to make policy manual updates and changes because we're always looking to improve after each election, clean up language. Stuff always comes up every single election, so it's always a good time to revisit that. And then let's see here. So some future balloting coming up. Obviously, we're all anxiously waiting on a tentative agreement, so that will be probably one of the next things that we ballot or vote on, followed by future constitutional referendums. And then, of course, the 2025 base officer elections, which seems like it's far away because it's March of 2025, but we will begin preparing for that um, starting probably the end of November and December. That whole process kicks off. Um, just a few other quick notes. Our vendor yes elections were, I think, on our eighth balloting or election with them. It's been going very well. We hold post elections meetings with them to see if there's any future enhancements or improvements in area, any area we can make for our membership to make uh, voting and balloting better. And uh, one thing after we get through the special election we'll be turning towards is working on future voter engagement. Uh, we've seen a trend in lower voter turnouts on some of the recent elections. We'd like to see that change. So we're gonna be looking at ways as a committee and um, other area, other departments or chairs here where we can work on engaging the membership and more to get that voter turnout a little bit higher and get our membership excited about voting not just when it comes to things like strike votes and tentatives. Uh, so that's all I have. Thank you. All of our information can be found on the website. Thanks, Adam. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus Riccardi, APFA National EAP Specialist. We also have Doug McCormick, APFA EAP Chair. I um, just want to kind of give you an overview of how EAP can help you. Um, EAP is your employee assistance program, flight attendant peer program, um, and it's comprised of three distinct facets, employee assistance, professional standards, and critical incentives response. Oftentimes, you know, flight attendants don't know what EAP is. They think that we help with everything. Well, we do, but oftentimes we may not be able to help you with contract and scheduling issues, so we will refer you in the right direction for that assistance. But what we do provide is emotional support, assistance to the flight attendants and their families, um, so on and so forth. Um, professional standards, so many of you still don't know that professional standards is no longer on its own. It's under the EAP umbrella. It operates as a self-help aid amongst our flying partners, providing conflict resolution and strategies uh, to those in need. Um, we also have the Critical Incidents Response Program, um, provides a range of crisis intervention strategies in the aftermath of critical incidents response, and we work very collaborative with the Safety and Security Department. Uh, for EIP peer representatives, you can contact 833-214-2002 or email us at EAP at EAPFA.org. We also have a, if you can, 
go to the next slide, Josh. Um, we also have the Flight Attendant Drug and Alcohol Program. Um, it's a substance abuse prevention program created and promoted for flight attendants um, and our professional and funded by the FAA. Um, throughout the FAA APFA site, you will find stigma free information, substance use, abuse and dependency information. Um, you can go to www.apfa.org to get help 855-333-2324. Or you can just give us a call and we can direct you um, and support um, anyone, including your family members through the Flight Attendant Drug and Alcohol Program. Next slide. Uh, I kind of went over professional standards um, and EAP, but we have 14 new AP, APFA EAP reps. Um, that completed EAP basic training in Denver. If you are interested in becoming a peer volunteer with EAP, um, go to the APFA EAP website and there is a link uh, where you could uh, apply. Uh, we do have a basic training coming up in October, so we'll be vetting new um, peer volunteers um, in the next few weeks. Uh, we did launch a new QR code. Um, this QR code will direct you to our EAP website where we provide you with a lot of information and resources that could help you as a flight and your family members as a flight attendant to deal with some of the issues and struggles that you may be facing in your life. I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Hi, Jania Big Crab, National IOD Chair. I just wanted to go over a few roles that you may see while you're out on IOD or should you become injured. Um, one of them is going to be the intake nurse. That is the only way to file an IOD. That is the official way of filing an IOD with American, and that's 844-777-8463. The next person you're going to have probably contact with is the claims adjuster. This is the person that will, again, reach out to you, take a recorded statement. Yes, it's okay to do the recorded statement um, and manage your claim with approving treatment and um, lost time and issuing checks. The other um, person that's part of the Sedgwick network is the nurse case manager. You might see this individual as a telephonic nurse, meaning text, email, um, phone call, they'll reach out to you, or there will be a field nurse, and this field nurse will actually go to an appointment with you. They do not have to go into the room. They can wait outside the room. That is a private and is covered by HIPAA. The field nurse will speak to the doctor after the appointment, and that is also okay. On the American side, we have our IOD admin group, or our long-term long leaning group. They are the actual ones that remove trips. So when your adjuster tells you that they will clear your line, they are actually reaching out to American and having them clear your line. It's not said, but they have no control over that. Uh, your FSM might reach out to you in regards to an ARCHA report. That's American's way of collecting their own personal data. and um, helping improve, hopefully, things that can injure a flight attendant. And the uh, last person is the claims analyst. That person is someone who reviews the claim overall. They do work for American. They are usually a good example of something they might do would be to, if you're issued a brace, and that brace needs to be compliant with our job duties and things like that. The other thing I want to talk about is that how APFA can assist you. Um, we can help you navigate the process, direct you to your state regulations, because uh, workers' comp is 99% state statutes. And so we can help you know, kind of explain those state statutes and direct you to that information and how to file an appeal if you have to file an appeal. It can also help you better understand a lot of questions are salary continuance and how that applies. There are two components to salary continuance, so there's a lot of confusion with that. Um, the other thing is coding. If you are calling out sick and you haven't seen your line updated, maybe your adjusters forgot to notify American, and we can help get coding on your line to avoid any occurrence issues. Um, we can help you advocate for yourself through the process with American and Sedgwick. Um, some of the things we don't have availability to is we don't get that you filed an IOD. We don't track your IOD. We don't get progression of your claim. So, um, those are things that we need you to reach out to us and share with us, and then we can direct you on what's the best way to handle that. Great. Thanks, Janaya. Janaya is the new chair for IOD as of April of this last year. Great job. Thank you, Janaya.
Um, hey everyone, I'm Allie Mallet, APFA Government Affairs Representative, along with Lori, who you heard from a little bit earlier. Um, the APFA Government Affairs Department has been quite busy supporting our negotiations in Washington. Um, we've had a number of members of Congress attend our pickets. Um, many have posted on social media and on Twitter in support of our negotiations, um, which we try to always repost. And if you see um, elected officials posting in support of us, please um, repost, thank them, help us amplify that message. Um, we've also had a number of letters in support of our negotiations. The Congressional Labor Caucus um, sent a letter directly to Robert Isom. And as you're probably aware, the uh, Senate and the House both sent sign-on letters to uh, directly to the National Mediation Board. Um, we've had 179 signatures on the House letter because uh, Representative Seth Magaziner sent um, a letter recently. Uh, he was on paternity leave while our original letter went out, so he wanted to be included on that. And in the Senate, as of yesterday, we have a 33rd signature, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia. Um, it's the deadline, but he is in support of us. Uh, That's okay. that letter. We'll give him a pass on <laughs> right? <laughs> if anyone else, if your member of Congress um, or senators did not sign the letter, um, we will welcome um, their follow-up letter as well. So um, 179 House members and 33 senators. Um, so it's pretty strong. Like I said, we have a lot of government involved in these Absolutely. negotiations, supporting yeah. us, trying to help us get to an agreement here. And I know I'm looking at Kim because I'm thinking this is the first time I can recall where we have actually Congress people and senators sending letters to the National Mediation Board saying, let them exercise their right to strike, right? Um, so a lot of support, yeah. a lot of, um, yeah, they're asking how they can help. They want to they wanna see, see this deal happen. Um, we all do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. yes. Um, we have a big election coming up in November. So one of the most important things you can do right now is check your voter registration status. As you can see, uh, this is all connected. We've got these letters uh, that have been sent and uh, this directly impacts your job. So double check that you are registered to vote, especially if you've moved recently or haven't voted recently. Um, vote. 411.org is a good place where you can check and it will send you to your state's um, registrar. Um, but you will have important elections up and down your ballot, national, state, and local levels. Um, and if you want to see if your representative signed on to the NMD letter, um, they are on the APFA website, on the government affairs page, um, on the issues tab, and the labor drop down menu. So um, you, you know, they, you should. Uh, Check to see if they've signed and see if that's someone you want to consider supporting um, in the future. Which brings me to um, the APFA PAC. Um, this is why the APFA PAC is so important to our larger mission as a union. Um, and we're very excited to debut um, the new APFA PAC sticker today. Um, so if you want the sticker, um, please sign up for the APFA PAC. It has the QR code on it. Um, so you can help other people sign up for the pack as well. Um, and if you already are a member of the pack um, and are excited to have the sticker, it'll be on the membership store soon um, or email us at legislation.apfa.org. Um, but as a reminder, it's voluntary. You can start and stop at any time, but we want to make sure that we have a labor friendly Congress um, heading into the next Congress next year. Absolutely. And that's it from Government Affairs today. Thanks, Allie. Hello everyone, Michael Mulhul, your National APFA Hotel Chair. So today we're going to be covering some functions um, outside and inside the scope of the APFA Hotel Department. Now the reason we're bringing this up and talking about it is because we do have many requests from the membership in regards to what essentially falls within our scope and outside of our scope. So the first thing that we're going to discuss is selecting hotels. We often receive port, uh, reports um, via the Hotel and Transportation Feedback Form, which you can find on the on the job section of the APFA website. As every department has reiterated today, the key here is collecting data. And we know many of you are frustrated on the jump seat. We see your frustrations online. We hear from friends. We see Facebook posts. But at the end of the day, when we are meeting with management, we need to bring that data and that data is collected via these forms. So 
in the forms we see feedback such as, why are we here? Why would APFA put me in this hotel? Why did APFA select this hotel? As Marty reiterated, at the end of the day, management must be held accountable for these hotels. So when we are selecting hotels, let me rephrase that, we do not select them. Uh, we solely recommend them. And that process is outlined in the JCBA, which your negotiators uh, in the past worked very hard on securing that language of what that looks like. If you would need a refresher, it's on section six, crew accommodations. Check that out. It outlines the entire process. In that process, we jointly inspect properties that are willing and wanting to bid on the business. So we often see much feedback of, I landed in the airport, I drove 15 minutes, why did I pass all these hotels and I want to stay in them? Well, we might want to stay in them, they don't want us staying in their properties for an array of reasons. Uh, a misconception that I like to bring up is the biggest high level is our check-in and check-out patterns. A lot of our hotels just want to check in guests at three o'clock and check them out at 11. As we know, our operation, it's a 24-7, 365 operation. We do not follow those patterns. So it's not because things are happening in the hotels that they don't want to house crew. It's essentially transportation requirements, following what we have in our JCBA and our check-in and check-out times is one of those reasons why hotels don't essentially want crew business. So again, just want to re reiterate, APFA does not select. We recommend there's an entire process of how that comes about. In that process, once we recommend, there are times that we don't agree with the company. There is also that process is outlined in the JCBA, but I, mostly we, we come to an agreement of what we feel is a sustainable, um, clean, quiet, comfortable property for our crew members. And once we agree on that property, American Airlines is responsible for contracting. So APFA and the hotel department does not have around 400 contracts with 400 hotels around the entire system and around the entire world. We have one contract, the JCBA, that we work very hard on that language and upholding that language. And that is our responsibility at the APFA hotel department is to make sure that the company and management is upholding that language and they manage those contracts and those relationships, which a hotel is essentially a vendor. It's a third party vendor that American manages that relationship with and is responsible with. So your documentation, your reports, when you submit them to us, we are not calling the hotel. The APFA hotel department, that's another thing I have on our outside of our scope is we do not communicate, we do not call, we do not speak, we do not call these hotels. If you're sitting in the lobby, I can't call up the Marriott in whatever random city and tell them to get you a room. There is a process, there's a procedure. We are all aware of those. If you need a refresher, you can reach out to us at hotel at APFA.org. The website has a plethora of information. Go there, check that out. But just want to make everyone sure at the end of the day, management, the company is responsible for calling these hotels, not us, not the APFA hotel department. There's 28,000 of us overnight all over the world, all over every, every time. So please follow that process. If you feel like there's a contractual violation after the fact, make sure you fill out the APFA hotel transportation form. Uh, as Marty already hit on, the IROC form was key, was very successful in our escalation uh, with management. So just want to say, communicating with them after hotel inspections, falls on the company. So of course we are doing our diligence of doing lots of site reviews and inspections. Uh, everyone wants to know where we're going, what hotels are we seeing? Well, once again, there's a great resource, the APFA hotel webpage. You can see every hotel that we stay in, every market that is being reviewed. So uh, next month we have LA, Charlotte, um, and XNA being reviewed. If you have feedback on those hotels, if you wanna see hotels added, if you want to learn more about that process, go to our website. It will show you where we are going, what we are doing. There's also a key update section on the APFA hotel webpage that gives you updates on the Paris Olympics, where we are staying, how long we're relocated, how long is it going to be. Please go to the website first before going to other areas of resources uh, to figure out the information. So high level, 
outside of our scope, just wanted to reiterate APFA Hotel does not select. We recommend, we do not contract, we uphold the JCBA, and we do not call or communicate with individual properties. We communicate with a company and make sure that company is upholding your crew accommodations and your transportation contractual rights. Thank you guys. And I'm going to pass it over to Kim with retirement. Thank you, Michael, for all of that. That is a good reminder that the, the employer is responsible for many things. We are here to help our flight attendants when the employer does not do what they're supposed to do, right? Or uphold the contract. Thank you for that. Period. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kim Tech, the APFA Retirement Specialist. Uh, thanks for being here today. Okay, this information about the employer doing what they're supposed to do kind of segues into what I'm discussing today because the employer has implemented a new process for notifying the company if you want to retire, but they didn't do a very good job about communicating it. So I've kind of been waiting this form. Um, the notification of this form went out in like a random email to each individual base. And I found it like maybe a month after it went out an email when I was checking my AA email, but I could have easily just deleted it as a base yeah. update or something like that, you know. So uh, American Airlines now has a retirement notification form. So it used to be that you would just call your manager and say, I want to retire. This is my last day as an active employee. This is my first day as a retiree. Um, that has been replaced with this form. It's not a paper form like the old retirement notification form that US Airways used to have. Um, so if you are familiar with that, it's it's an online form now. And I put the I've included the path to find the form and you go to the JetNet link to the flight service or in-flight website, uh, flight attendant service center resources and then you'll find the retirement notification form under the list of resources. Um, and basically, it, it's to streamline things because some flight service managers didn't really have a good idea of really what they were supposed to do when someone was retiring and sometimes retirements uh, didn't get processed correctly. So this makes it kind of consistent across the board. So I think it will be a good thing, but it's getting the, um, you know, the communication out to the uh, flight attendants that this is what the process is now. And I don't think the company's done a super good job of that. I've been waiting, but now I decided to put it out because it's not really clear. Thank you, Kim. We need that. Our flight attendants need this information mm -hmm. for sure. So um, basically you go to the form and it's going to tell you, you know, they're going to give you some information about you know, they want your, here's the form basically, they want your name, your base, your employee number, and they want you to put in a date of retirement. So you can put in that date. Um, just below the submitting the retirement notification form, if you submit it and you come back to this area in the flight service website, there's an option to rescind your retirement form. So if you go in and you're upset, you had a horrible flight, I'm going to retire in a week, you know, click, I submit it. You can go in and rescind it. But I mean, yeah. if if you're kind of clicking and you're really upset and you go, I'm going to retire today. I had one girl do that and then she later wanted to rescind it. It went through right, right away. So I don't you know, recommend that you put in to retire on that exact same day because sometimes people have clickers remorse. Yeah, they, <laughs> and they go, no, no, I, I really don't want to do that. But if it's for the same day, you're too late. It's What's already it? gone in, you know, so don't do it. And what I recommend is doing it 30 days out from your retirement date because if you do it at the beginning of a calendar month, then putting that form in, it, and make sure you don't hold a bid for the next month and somebody else can hold those trips. You know, if you do it two weeks out, we'll have already bid. So the company only requires two weeks, but if you want to be nice to the other flight attendants, do it 30 days out. You can do it 30 days out and then they're going to remove you from any trips you held um, from the day of your retirement until 
you know, infinity, <laughs> basically. Yeah. So, um, but just wanted to let you know that form is in there. This is the first part of it. And then the second part, you know, they want your address and it says, explains by clicking the form, you're notifying the company of your intent to retire. And then you hit submit. That's the button down there. So uh, that's the way it works. It's pretty straightforward that a lot of people still aren't aware of its existence. So I wanted to bring it up and make sure everyone's aware. Great. Thank you so much, Ken. Appreciate that. All right. Hello, I am Justin Marsh. I'm the new archives chair. Uh, I don't really have a lot of information to give out to membership right now. Uh, most of my time so far has just been scanning stuff in and getting it all documented and helping doing searches for our national leaders and other departments, finding information they need in our archives. Um, but we do have some fun stuff coming up and as soon as we nail down the details, I will be sure to get that out to membership. Thank you so much. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, Josh Black, APF National Secretary, thank you all for being on today. I just want to remind everyone that this is a recorded session. It will be going out via hotline and published on the APFA website within the next couple of days. And uh, all of these slides will be published on the website as well. And I'll hand it over to Julie to close us out. I guess you probably should have said that at the beginning. So yeah. <laughs> screenshotting. I know our flight attendants are so used to screenshotting their life yeah. um, these days to make sure that so they true. have record of everything but um but yes it'll be we'll add it into our collection and hopefully we'll be having another one of these very soon um we we were shooting for quarterly um maybe we'll get back into that stream of um having those town halls for membership uh hopefully all this information has been very helpful to all of you um especially in all the different departments that we have here and everything that the union is doing for you i just want to thank all of you again for all of your support during the past couple of years of these negotiations, showing up at the pickets, showing up at State of the Airline, showing up at the White House for a picketing event. I think we've got a lot of firsts this year. Um, we were also at uh, in New York uh, at the Stock Exchange picketing. Uh, so I, I will say it has been uh, amazing to see everyone out there fighting to get what you have earned and deserve and we will continue this fight until we get the contract that you all have earned so thank you so much please keep wearing your red pins your red lanyards make sure you don't put those stickers on the aircraft um, i'll have to get that in again and um, we will see you next time and we will hopefully have more to report out very soon to you about negotiations thank you again bye everyone goodbye bye, bye.